Praise God. Praise God. Come on, let's magnify Him today. In the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20. Amen. Divine exchange. It should have been us on that cross. But God, who is rich in mercy, aren't you glad he took our place? And he's alive today. Amen. He's alive. First Peter chapter 3, reading with verse 20. Amen. Sister Amy Melvin, would you wave your hand back there? She sent me a message today and said that she wanted to share a praise report. She had radiation on her thyroid and uh, they had told her she would be medicated for the rest of her life, but went for blood work and her thyroid, the levels are perfect. She no longer needs medication. She said, it's an act of God. It's a miracle. Amen, amen. She's had a heart condition She's been on medication with that as well, but it looks like she told me that, that her, her levels are perfect. They are believing there will be no heart medication either necessary. God's a healer. How many know he's a healer? Praise God. Who else is gonna be healed? Who else is gonna be saved? Who else is gonna get deliverance? Who else is gonna have a life-changing experience? Can somebody say amen? Praise God. 1 Peter 3 and 20, and so we praise the Lord with you, Sister Amy. It says in verse 20, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering, I exaggerated the word a little bit, but that's what it means. Everybody say long suffering. The long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. While the ark was a preparing wherein Few, that is, everybody say, eight souls were saved by water. Eight souls were saved by water. Verse 21 makes uh, first three words is what I'm really teaching from the last two weeks or last week and tonight. The like figure. Everybody say the like figure. Another, really, what that means, it's a parallel. What he did for Noah, this is how it applies to us. Last week, what he did for the children of Israel coming through the Red Sea, baptized in the sea and in the cloud, what he did for them, this is how it applies to us. Or what he's doing for us, this is what happened to them. Everybody say a parallel. Whereunto, the like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. A lot of people don't believe that but we believe it because it's biblical. Baptism saves us. I mean, it's part of it. It's not all of it. It's not how holy the water is. It's the obedience to the word of God. Do you believe that? It explains baptism saying what it does and saving it. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like to preach from these two verses just on biblical parallels. I'd like to preach on the parallel of Noah, the, Noah the flood and baptism. God bless you as you are seated. The world was wicked. Genesis records in the story of Noah and the ark. I'm trying to be very careful because somehow I'm trying to put Jonah in that boat. I, I, I am. I don't know if I'm trying to save Jonah or what. I don't know what I'm doing here. But uh, when I was 17 years old and preaching, I preached Moses was in that ark. And somehow they still amen me somehow. And uh, my dad later, he said, Moses wasn't in that ark. Thank God for a church that lets us grow. Can you say amen? Um, when you are Looking at the word of the Lord, the, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter six, you want to open your Bibles and follow along, you can. I'll be teaching tonight. But in Genesis chapter six, it, it, it says in verse five, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every 
imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. When God saw the earth, he saw it was polluted with wicked things, wicked imaginations, uh, the desires of the common person or human. And uh, he said, uh, uh, when you look, look at that, there, the wickedness was throughout. Sin was throughout. Um, and, you know, I, I have to share this, that I had lunch today with DJ Hot. And uh, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to have lunch with him again. And uh, he, he said, I said, you did a good job praying in chapel the other day. He said, well, I like to pray. He sat in the seat eating uh, chicken nuggets, you know, and with me. And uh, he said, I, I like to pray. And he said, I'm thankful. He couldn't just say it. He had a bounce in his seat, you know. I'm thankful, he said. He said, I pray every morning. I pray every morning. He said, I did it. And uh, he said, because I'm thankful. And I said, well, what are you thankful for? He said, he made this whole earth. He said, everything he's done. He said, he said, he hadn't done all this. He said, we wouldn't even, we humans wouldn't even exist. I said, are you a human? He said, why sure. <laughs> and I said, I said, well, I would like you to pray sometime at the church for all of us. He said, oh, I will. And he said, I will not only pray for them, but I'm going to bless all those watching online too. Isn't that awesome? I'm telling you, the world better get ready. DJ's coming. Amen. But here it is. And he, he's, he looks down and when he says that man was evil, I'm going to tell you, he was talking about all those humans DJ was talking about. All these humans, the thought was evil. It wasn't even toward the Lord. It was somehow straight away from what it used to be. They're not even thinking of God. They're, they're eating. They're drinking. They're marrying. They're giving in marriage. But God's nowhere in the thought process. I mean, no, it's, uh, if we're not careful, that's where all of us can get to. And, amen. We have to be very, very careful. And so the thought is evil continuing. The Lord looks out of heaven. And you, know, you have to understand God's looking out of heaven. And he looks down and sees if people are spending time with him and what they're spending time with, what they're thinking about, if he's even on the mind. I think we have to be careful. We get so busy, we don't even talk to him. We don't want to open his word. We, you know, you have, to be in, uh, you have to be intentional to keep a great marriage. You have to be intentional to train up children. You have to be intentional to do good on the job. And you have to be intentional to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not just unfolds. It just doesn't happen. You've you got to make it happen. How many know that? You've got to be intentional to keep the grass looking right. You know, it's growing like crazy right now. And you have to be intentional how to have things. You, you have to be intentional. But what happens when you become non-intentional, things that you value will be lost. Because you have to stay focused. It's a disciplinary thing that you've got to do. If we're not careful, culture will come in and take over and we'll be consumed with what everybody is doing and are we keeping up with everybody else instead of focusing on what God wants us to do. Can you say amen? We all, all we like sheep have gone astray. Every man turned away by his own what? Lust or desires. And so that's what happened over a, a, a period of time, not, not just in one generation, but generation after generation and, and uh, turned away from the Lord. Noah, by the way, was right at 500 years when, when uh, uh, he was building this ark, 500 years old. You know, pre-flood things were so different than post-flood things. Atmospheric pressure, animals lived much longer. People live much longer. I mean, Methuselah was over 900 years old when he died. Uh, uh, some believe that the, uh, how many's ever heard of a hyperbaric chamber? And when you get in a hyperbaric chamber and, and uh, they, they actually put football players and stuff in there because the atmospheric pressure, the oxygen content, things of that nature are so perfect that it allows the body to heal much quicker. They have put animals in there and they have grown reptiles, for instance, grow much larger and grow faster because, and they have taken sap things from, 
from uh, like petrified force type of thing, sap, and they dated them back pre-flood and found the oxygen content inside of those air bubbles and have shown that the oxygen was perfect for what we really need to do to thrive. And that since the flood, it's all been changed. And how many know we don't live 500 years now? Some of you have been like, I feel 500 years old. We don't live 500 years, but it's different now. Everybody says it's different now. It appears that even pre-flood, they didn't eat, mate, eat, eat meat. Post-flood, they did. He said, kill and eat. And I'm sort of glad about that. Amen. <laughs> I'm really, I'm getting off here. I got to get back on the, in, the, in the word. But when you really begin to look at what happened is pre-flood and post-flood, there was this falling away concept from the things of God. They're not even thinking of God. They're not even considering God. And God looks out of heaven and nobody's thinking about him, hardly at all. And he is so disgusted with the way they're living. He said, I am going to destroy this earth. But there was one man, everybody say one man. One man in the midst of all the immorality and all the chaos and everybody that has fallen away, there's one man down there that says, Lord, I'll serve you. Hey God, I'll serve you. I won't go the way of the world. I won't live the way everybody else is living. And we can read, we can read here when it says in verse seven, the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have what? Made, God was so upset. Do you believe God's emotional? Yes, he is. He's a jealous God. He looks down. There's nobody thinking. He made man to praise him. He made man to be in relationship with him. He made man to, to walk with him and talk with him. We, we sing the song about just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, Lord, let it be. I am weak, but thou art strong. And I'm gonna tell you right now, we need to stop here and realize we need God in our life. I am weak. You are strong. You are the origin of my flesh. You are the originator of who I am. Can I tell you the reason that you need God is because he is your source. Somebody shout, the Lord is my source. Watch this, if you, when he, when he would create the heaven and the earth in Genesis one and read it later, but when he was going to create, when he was going to create the birds, he spoke to the, he spoke to the sky. When he was going to create the fish and the whales and, and uh, uh, those things, he spoke to the sea. When he was going to create a cow, he, he, he spoke to the land. And so what he did was let the earth bring forth, let the sea bring forth, and let the air bring forth. What happens when you take a fish out of the sea and lay it on the land? Somebody said dinner. <laughs> it's gonna die. It's gonna wither away and die because it's been removed from its source. What are you gonna do if you take a cow and you put it out in the middle of the ocean? It's gonna die because it was removed from its source. So when he said, let us make man in our image, what was he doing? He was speaking to himself. He didn't speak to the ground, didn't speak to the water, didn't speak. He said, let us make man. Let the earth bring forth, let the sea, let the sky. But when he made us, he said, let us make man in our image. Why was he speaking to himself? I'm gonna tell you why, because he is our source. Now you were made from the ground. That's why you've got to eat dirt. If you don't eat dirt, you die. Come on, some of you getting ready to plant some things in the dirt. Cabbage, my neighbor said, I'm gonna plant cabbage tomorrow. He's getting ready to eat from the ground. I know tomatoes look good, but they're from the dirt. You don't eat tomatoes and lettuce and ice cream and <laughs> because it comes from a cow. Cow eats green grass. Brown cow eats green grass. Gives white milk, makes yellow butter. Under a blue sky, there you go. 
But what happens is, is if you don't eat from the ground, you will die because from your flesh, that is your source. God formed man from the dust of the ground. The same, listen, but there's a part of you that's not like the cow, the fish, and the bird. It is the soul of a man. Only man has a soul. Man became a living soul. And that's why you need him in the morning. You need him in the evening. That's what makes you thrive, is to have a relationship with your source. We baptized a young man last week and I met him when he came out of the water. I shook his hand. Jared, I said, how do you feel? And his response was, I have never felt better a day in my life. Why? Because he had been reunited to his source. Hey, hey, February the 14th is Valentine's Day. You show these beautiful roses, the red, and they bloom, and then they die. Why? Because they've been severed from its source. If we just get disconnected from him, we're going to be emotionally bankrupt. Our emotions aren't going to be right. We're not going to feel right. We're going to, we're, going to, we're going to be successful in the world in some levels of temporal things. And we're going to say something's missing. I don't know what it is. I feel empty. What is it? You need God. He is your source. He is my source and my strength. He's the light of my life. Oh, my cup runneth over. The psalmist said, I'm fulfilled. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, there's something about that Holy Ghost. It's God breathing on me again. Oh, clap your hands and praise him. Aren't you glad that God is your source? He breathed into his nostrils, Genesis 2 and 7. Throw that up there for me. Genesis 2 and 7. I've got to get to Noah here in a minute. Genesis 2 and 7, look what it says. And God formed man, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And what? Breathe. Everybody breathe. You stop breathing, we're all gonna have issues. Service is gonna be interrupted. How many know it? You stop breathing. Everybody say breathe. breathe. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. My goodness. Read on. And man became a living soul. He was just laying there. But when God breathed on him, go to the New Testament, the Bible says Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Ghost. When you say the Spirit of God, when the Bible says in Genesis 1 and, and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters, the word Spirit of God actually means the breath of God. Everybody say breath of God. And so what happens is, is when God breathes upon you, he breathes life, life. But not just to live in a temporal, but it allowed man to become a living soul. Go to the day of Pentecost. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Verse two, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance. It was God's breath that gives you life. I'm gonna stop here and tell you today, when God breathes, it always brings life. It brings fulfillment. That's what we need. We need the wind of God. We need the breath of God. How many want God to move upon you tonight? How many know it's what we need on a Wednesday? We need the breath of God. He's my source. That's why, that's why people would pray things like this. He's, he's the bread when I'm hungry. He's the water when I'm thirsty. He's my shelter in the time of storm. He's the rock in the weary land. I just want to know on a Wednesday night, is there anybody in this building that can stand and say, he is my source. He is my joy. He is my peace. Oh, and I love him. I love him. I love him so. He's been good to me. God has been good to me. Oh, somebody shout, he's been good to me. Oh my goodness, and we rejoice because we know he's the healer of our salvation. Oh glory, you may be seated, but the problem was in Noah's day is nobody now is connected to God. 
Now everybody's doing their own thing, living their own life, their own path with zero relationship with the Lord. Not even talking about him in the home. No conversation between the wife and the husband. There's no conversation about God between the children or, or there's just no conversation about God. How can these descendants of Adam who walk with God in the garden not even have a conversation about God, but instead it's how to take away from my brother, how to cheat, how to lie, how to steal, how to do things that please the flesh, that do not please God. There's a bluegrass song and I realize everybody in the room listens to bluegrass every day. There's a bluegrass song that's, the title of it is this, just because you, just because you could doesn't mean you should. Just because it's available and you want to doesn't mean it's right. Every man is drawn away and so there's this, there's this Christ-like nature we got to have to suppress those things that aren't right. No, I'm not looking at that. No, I'm not going to take, just, just, just because you can drink a pot of coffee doesn't mean you should. Just because you can eat the whole pie doesn't mean you should. My lands, we can go down this road all day long and offend everybody in the building. Just because you need to eat a foot long. Well, I need to go back to the word of God. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. Just because I can drink a 12 pack of Diet Coke. Oh, I don't need to go there. I, it's diet. Praise God. I'm okay because it's diet. I, amen. <laughs> they, were, they were everything but what God designed them. They're selfish. They're selfish. Whatever they want, that's what they did. And God said, it's not how I designed it. This is not my plan. It's not what I wanted. I made them to have a relationship with me. You know, something's missing in us when we don't have a relationship with God. You can teach a Sunday school class and not have a relationship with God. You can preach from this pulpit and get out of relationship with God. Because it's not about talking about him. It's being with him. And there is a difference. Can, can I say to the anchor, when we come to church, and it's so powerful here tonight, we feel it all over the building right now. But when you're at the house of God, this isn't about fulfilling religious duties so we can check it. This is about being with him. I've come to praise him. I'm going to worship him. I want to feel it. <laughs> Woo, I want to feel the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Somebody shout with him. And so you'll find that Noah, Noah looked out and man, I just think we ought to praise him. Just take a moment and say, God, I don't want church to be about me or somebody else. I want it to be about you. I want to know you. I want to walk with you. I want to do what you'd have me to do. Oh, oh God, I want to do what you would have me to do in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. And the Bible says in this moment when God is so angry, He's repented that he has even made man. He is frustrated at the response of the people that were made in his image. It is not what he wanted, but the Bible says in the midst of all of that, in the midst of the darkness of men's souls, verse eight says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God scanning the earth seeing all this nonsense and immorality and corruptness and selfishness. But it's like Noah is highlighted. It's stand up, Brother Andrew. It's like everybody else in the room is doing something else, but there's somebody standing out and being different. You know what? God honors that. That's what we call holiness. Holiness is not an outfit. Holiness is, is a character. It's a nature. It's the mind of God. It's the way we think. It's not what we do, it's who we are. If it's just a checklist, it's called legalism. But if it's a relationship, it's called holiness. I'm not doing this because I have to. I'm doing this because I'm walking with God. I want to please him. Woo! I want to please him. You're not making me do this. No, I want to please the Lord. I'm walking with God. I want him to be happy with who I am. I want the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart to be accepted in his sight. And it's called grace. And Noah, Noah says, Noah says, these are, it says these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. 
a perfect and perfect in his generations. Could I say to every mother, could I say to every mother in this building, you do not have to fret because of culture. One of the most wicked times ever was Noah's day and the Bible says that Noah was perfect in his generations. Reason it wasn't generation because he's so old. 500 years, but he was perfect in the midst of chaos. Brother Nehemiah, we're in a day where the young people, listen, I've never seen a generation like them. It doesn't matter how sick the culture gets, there's a generation that says, I'm gonna walk with God, I'm gonna do the will of God. Come on, you can see it in these young people. They're, you ought to compliment them. You ought to pat them on the back. They wanna be virgins when they get married. They don't want drugs in it. Come on, it's a God culture. It's a Noah culture. I'm proud of them. I can't help it. I'm so, I'm so thankful for our young people and our young adults and these young couples. They've got the mind of God. Their rooms are messy, but they got the mind of God. They eat sloppy, but they're, they've got the mind of God. Their handwriting's terrible, but they've got the mind of God. They sometimes stay on their phone too much, but they've got the mind of God. Amen. They don't have always the greatest responsibilities, but they're only 13 and 12. We can't knock them down when deep down inside, they've got conviction that says, I want to do it right. Come on, we can't. I feel the Lord preaching to me right now. I'm thankful I've got a son and a daughter that want to do right. Oh, God, help us. Hallelujah. Man, I'm off, to, I, I'm off what I was gonna talk about, but I feel this. All of you men in the building better understand. Your wife, your wife is not, is not your house cleaner. She's not the person that picks up your underwear. She's not just the person to make you happy and please you. You need to understand that the wife that God gave you is, is for your benefit. You'll be lost without her. You need her in your life. She's not to be demanded. She's to be encouraged. She's to be uplifted. Tell her how pretty she is, how valuable she is. You need her in your life. Come on, can you say amen? My goodness. I was getting ready to preach on the women to the husbands in just a second, but I feel like I've covered it good enough here tonight. We gotta understand the value of one another. Amen, we need to honor each other. Somebody shout honor. honor. In, a, in a, one of the most craziest cultures that's ever existed is now. It's chaos. Even sinners know there's something wrong. How many know it's right? It's chaos. And if we're not careful, we'll come to church and we'll find petty things against one another small issues between one another and we can't do that. We got to honor one another. Thank you for being holy. Thank you for being an encouragement to me. It's, it does my heart good to see you at church. I love the way you worship. I'm thankful that you're faithful. Come on, saints ought to do that with each other. I'm so glad you're here. I've been praying for you. Come on, we... On a Wednesday night, in a, on a Wednesday night, you've got young people there. You've got people in classes in different rooms. We've got a Bible study going on here. And sometimes we feel so insecure because of a world of chaos and we feel like Noah and all alone. When we get to the house of God, we shouldn't feel like we're by ourselves. We ought to feel like we're together. We're together. Amen, I'm appreciated here. Somebody shout glory. Look at your neighbor and say, the pastor said to honor me. Amen. I want every man in the room to stand. Do not be intimidated to pray in front of your wife. I feel this tonight. My goodness. Every man in this room ought to sit down with your children and talk about the things of God. Listen, men. Every, every man in this room, look at me. You've been made in the image of God. Your children are going to see God through you how you act, how you treat them. They need to hear faith stories from you. They need to hear you talking about a prayer meeting that you had. Let me tell you why Isaac wanted it is because Abraham talked about his experiences with God. Let me tell you why Jacob wanted it because he heard Abraham and Isaac talking about their experiences with God. We cannot let 
a generation be lost because they don't have uh, the, 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 the headship talking about the things of God. God never intended to be talked about just at a church service. He wanted you to be talked to him to be talked about in the home. If there would have been a home, there would have never been a flood. The home's got to talk about it. Everybody, yeah, look at me. God wants you to talk about him. Which means, number one, you've got to have a relationship with him. Pray and seek the face of God. Let's give our men a hand. I feel that. Thank God for our men. We have a lot of amazing men that go to this church. Hardworking, righteous, godly men. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise God. Shout and worship and get emotional. Whoever thought that it was weak to cry did us a disservice. Real men don't cry. That's hogwash. God wept. He's not just pretty strong. I asked, I asked Sawyer one time when he was little, I said, who's the strongest guy that you know? He said, Nehemiah. I said, I thought I was. You know, dad's supposed to be the strongest, you know. I'd go to school and tell my, I'd go to school and tell my buddies, my dad can carry a tree. I would. I saw him pick up, you know, some type of log tree thing. I went and bragged on him. I was just trying to get him to do the same for me, you know. I said, I'm not strong. He said, actually, Jesus is the strongest one. Can't argue with that. I think we've got to understand that we've got to be men. Bear our hearts before the Lord and express our praise before him in front of our children and our wives. If he's done anything for you, there's nothing more godly. There's nothing more manly than a man of God, a husband, a father to stand in the presence of God and tears of thanksgiving running and dripping off of his chin Amen, dripping onto his shirt, thinking of the goodness of God and saying everything we have is a gift from the Lord, every good thing that we have. I'm telling you, God will flood that man with blessings. God will flood that family with blessings. I feel a flood coming. I'm not talking about destruction. If you'll just pray, come on, anybody want to praise him? Is there some man thankful tonight before I move on? You jump on your feet and say, God's been good to me. God's been good to my family. He's been good. He's been good. He's been good. He's been overwhelmingly good. To me. Amen. Watch this. You can be seated. I, I gotta get I gotta get this boat floating. <laughs> floating here in a minute. And so what happened is God Noah said, I'll walk with you. Did you see it in the scripture? Look what it says in verse 9. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. He had three sons. We got three sons, Sham, Ham, and Japheth. The Bible says the earth was corrupt before the Lord. The earth was filled with what? Violence. Sound familiar? Come on, sound familiar in our streets? Yes, it does. God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt. And for all flesh had corrupted his way up on the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark and shalt pitch it with and without with pitch. That is like a, a bituminous. It was a, like a tar. The, the ark would have actually been wood, with, would have been black with tar that bubbled up out of the hot springs that were about eight miles from there where he built, built that boat and the, the tar would come up from the earth and they would scoop it up. Those boys would go down in some makeshift buckets and carry that tar and come back and hundred and over a hundred years, they built it with gopher wood. They built it, they, they, they sealed it with a, a tar so the water couldn't get in and stuff couldn't get out. It was sealed within and without. This, this boat was a massive boat. It was, it was 60 feet tall. It was, it was three football fields long. It was a massive, massive building. I mean, no, it's true. The door was so big on the boat that elephants could walk across it. 
And when he got it done, the Bible, the Bible says he was moved by God. He was warned by God, moved by fear. He condemned the world to the saving of his house. Everybody say, warned by God. Warned by God. Moved, by moved by fear. He condemned the world and saved his house. You know how you save your house? Number one, you gotta listen to the word of God. You gotta have a fear of God. It ought to move us to action. He was warned by God and moved. Look at your neighbor and say, move. You can sit idle and listen, but you gotta move. The word of God will cause you, if you believe it, to move in the direction. Somebody shout, move. Moved, warned by God, moved by fear. And he did what? Condemned the world. Somebody's got to stand up and say, that's not right. That's sin. We don't allow that in our house. We're not going to do that. That's not how we live. God didn't intend. You got to condemn it. Somebody recently made a statement. They said, I, you're not being judged. You just don't, we're not being judgmental. You just don't want to be corrected. And we're not careful that we'll get in this motion. Well, I don't want to be judgmental. I don't want to be. Listen, somebody's got to stand up and draw the line and say, that's sin. That's not arrogance. That's the word of God. We can't have sin and survive. Somebody got to stand on his word and say, that's not right. You want to save your kids? Talk about what sin is. We don't do it. We don't allow that. Oh, somebody shout Glory. Amen. Political correctness is nowhere in scripture. So he condemned the world to saving of his own house. All of a sudden there came this call that went out. Animals from all over. Two of a kind and seven of a kind begin to make their way to the ark. Giraffes, elephants, dogs, cats. I've got to ask the Lord about ants and rats. When I get there, what in the world? Here they come. Begin to make their way on that ark. How did they get there? He went and riding a horse and lasso on them, dragging them to that boat. Oh no. Two were in the field. One was taken and another one was left. There was a call of God that went. Everybody say a call of God. Drew them to that boat. There was a drawing into that boat. That's what's happening right now, Brother Dean Reinhardt. There was a drawing of God that's happening all over the world. Jews, what you see happening with the Jews physically, I heard that they had some bombings going on there. But what you see happening in, in Israel in the physical is what's happening in the church, in the spiritual. We are the spiritual people of God. Can you say amen? amen. And people are leaving their countries from all over the world and returning to Jerusalem. Matter of fact, the, the, uh, the president of Iran, he said, I hope they all land here so I can destroy all of them with one bomb. That's the hatred of the Jews. But they are gathering there from all over the world. Why are they gathering there? Because it's the end time end draw. That's why God is drawing backsliders from all over. It's happening all over the world, all over the nation. You know why? Because no man cometh to God except the Spirit draws him. This is a parallel. There's an indrawing of God to the boat. There's, come on, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? God has set in front of us a salvation plan. And the salvation plan was right here. Come out from the world and get on the boat. And God said to Noah, everybody said he was called the eighth man. Yeah. Hey, honey. I was getting ready to say you're going to be my wife, but you are my wife. Here. I'm going to be Noah. I'm going to be Noah. I love this lady. She's the best. Come on, Ham, Sham, and Japheth. Come up here. Ham and Japheth. My land. Now we need to get you all wives. We got to get you some wives here for a minute. You two, come here, Sister Ashley. Come and help me. You're closest three. Closest three. Come on, you three wives. Come on, Whitney. Everybody's saying, awkward. <laughs> come on, go stand by your husbands right here, Sister Ashley. Now watch. Watch. <laughs> we, somebody have a phone to take a picture of this. this is, how did I know that David Wallace would have a camera? we know that might as well smile you're on camera but watch here's the door here's the door 
And Noah stands beside the door. Come on, son. Get in. I know what time it is. Come on, son. Come on, Sham. Get in. Y'all get up on the platform. That boat's bigger than that. Come on. Japheth. Get on. Honey, make sure they're all in there. And God said, get on that boat, Noah. The time is now. See, God will never just, he lets us know when the time is. It's a biblical pair, as it was in the days of Noah. See, when they wrote the New Testament, there was no New Testament. When, when Paul, when, when Simon Peter's writing this epistle, there was no New Testament. There was only the Old Testament. So he is teaching the believers to understand their experience and what to look for by the word of the Lord, by basing it on parallels of the Old Testament. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. And, and he's comparing baptism to this. And get on the boat. When they got on the boat, the door shut. God shut the door. Look at your neighbor and say, God shut the door. He was called in the Bible the eighth man. Why? It was his responsibility to get his family on that boat. That's my responsibility is to make sure my family is going to get on that boat. Everybody save that boat. Give him a hand. Thank you for helping me. It's hard to believe Lake, Lakin's graduating next week. She would ride home with me on Sunday sometimes on the way home from Sunday school one day. I'd ask her always. Sometimes it was just she and I in the, the car and say, did you learn anything today in Sunday school? Oh, yeah, Daddy. I was. <laughs> she she'd just chatter, you know. She, uh, she, I said, what would you learn about? She said, no on the ark. She said, they didn't have very good options. I said, what do you mean? She said, it was either the flood or. <laughs> she said, you know what animals do. I guess the stink's better than the storm, isn't it? What does it mean? How do we compare Noah and the ark to baptism? What was Peter talking about? Because once the door was shut, it was over. All of a sudden, Peter patter patter pitter the rain began to fall they tell us that it had never rained on the earth ever until this moment the earth was watered by dew the climate the way things were the way the earth was at its moment I mean they've proven the flood you can study I was in a in a geology class in engineering school and my teacher was an atheist and he said well you know the Bible does talk he was an atheist didn't believe but and he knew I was a preacher and uh, I'd go talk to him uh, for several reasons, amen. But there is an, an aligning that he said that goes through the whole world that represents an event that happened catastrophically to the whole world at one time. Noah's Ark, the flood that happened, there is an aligning that goes to the whole world. Man, I feel God. It's truth, isn't it? And uh, the water came and flooded the earth. And when it flooded the earth, People were lost. People were lost. Judgment came. It was the judgment of God. People were lost. And uh, all of a sudden, that once the water had raised, and all of a sudden those, those streams became rivers. And, you know, in West Virginia, we call them gully washers. Come out. And like I say, you know, that boat began to rock. That was designed by God, every element, the dimensions, the material, all of it was God's design. Because salvation is never designed by man. Let God be true and every man a liar. Don't you let somebody tell you, well, I just don't think God, I'm not so sure God would, don't, don't listen to that. We don't need philosophers. We need the word. How you know you're saved? Because of the word of God. God's word said this. We don't need traditions. We need the word of God. Everybody say tradition or the word of God. 
The Bible says don't, don't be, follow the traditions of men or the rudiments of the world. Men create all kinds of stuff that's not the way of God. If it doesn't align in scripture, and all of a sudden that boat began to rock and it began to float. And it, when it, it, it began to float and went above and it's over the top of the mountains and there's not one animal alive except that which can live in the sea and is or in the boat. After a year of being in that, it wasn't a cruise ship. It settled down on Mount Ararat. But how did they know, watch this, how did they know there was new land in that period of time before it landed? What did he do? Everybody take your hand and hold that dove with me. Open the one window of the boat and let the dove out. A fact about a dove is a dove will never land on anything dirty. Doves only land on things that are clean. And they knew, they knew it would only land where there's going to be life, man. And when the dove returned, it had what in its mouth? An olive branch. Had snapped an olive branch and brought it back to the ark. And when, the, when it came back and landed in the preacher's hand, that, that dove, landed, it had an olive branch in its mouth, which represents peace. Peace on, y'all don't want me to preach tonight. You want to go eat Taco Bell. Peace on earth. It's the symbol of peace. Are y'all with me tonight? Can I go a little bit far longer? Man, I feel the help of the Lord here tonight. I really do. Hallelujah. The sign of life, the sign of new life, the sign of a new beginning, the sign that land had been cleansed, the sign that the earth had been cleansed was returned by a dove with an olive branch in the mouth. All right, now, now, now bear with me there. Uh, why did it do this? Jesus said in, in Luke 4, 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he hath what? Anointed me. Where do you get anointing oil from? An olive. All of it was parallels and symbolic to a new life experience. Can I just go and tell you, I don't care how bad you were, what you did, how bad the family was, how bad the mess was, how dark the sin, the chaos, the confusion. When you go down in repentance, you come out of that and get on that salvation. I feel, I feel like DJ Hot. Glory. When you go down in repentance and you say, take me to the water. You see, the water in Noah's day, what did it do? It didn't say eight people were saved by the ark. It said eight souls were saved by water. First Peter 3, 20, the long suffering of God waited. God waited. And then all of a sudden when the water came, why, why did it say that eight, those eight, Noah, his wife, Ham, Sham, and Japheth, and their wives. That's eight souls. You would have thought to be saved from the flood, you would have been saved by the ark, but it didn't say eight people, it said eight souls. Because the soul, the, the soul issue is a sin issue, and what God was doing, he was wiping the slate clean. He's gonna say, it's gonna be a whole new beginning. I found somebody that wants to serve me, so I'm gonna remove all the sin and all the chaos and all the confusion and all the past and all the mess that they've been living with, and when they come out of the water, there's not gonna be one sin, one, one mess, it's going to be gone. It's going to be over. It's going to be out. It's going to be cleansed. Oh, I feel like preaching here tonight. It's going to be cleansed. And so the water in Noah's day, when it came, it destroyed the sin. It washed away the sin. And aren't you glad it lifted them up above sin? That's what happens when you repent of your sins is when you get in that door. That's when you get in that boat. That's when, you, hey, honey, come on. Let's get in the boat. God said the time is now. You don't want to miss your now time in repentance. The, the repentance is a space of repentance. God will not always, Spirit of the Lord will not always strive with man. There's a moment that you gotta get in before it's too late. I feel like an old time evangelist right now when the time is now. You can't put off tomorrow what God called you to do right now. He said, get in the boat. Come on, honey. Get the kids. Get your wives. Come on. The time is now. Somebody shout, the time is now. And the door shut. You are separated from the world through repentance. But guess what? It's not good enough just to repent. There's more. Repent and be 
baptized, submerged. You, you can even say it that way. Repent and be submerged. Every one of you, Acts 2, 38. In the name of Jesus Christ, for what? The remission of sins. Why did Simon Peter in his writing say that baptism doth also now save us. Why? It's a parallel. What the water did for Noah, his wife, his boys, and their wives is what baptism does for you. When you repent of your sins, you got on the boat, but you get down in the water, it's gonna destroy the sin in your life. It's gonna wash away. <laughs> it's gonna wash away the sin in your life and you're gonna come up out of that water. The Romans 6, 4 says you will arise to walk in newness of life, a life of no sin. Your mistake, let's all stand. It's gone, it's washed away. He's removed it all. Almost done, I promise. Here goes, just remain standing. I'm not gonna hold you long. I'm not gonna do like I did Mother's Day. Bear with me, watch. And when they're on the boat and the world has been cleansed, there would have been no evidence over, after over a year in the water of any leftovers of the wickedness. Hydraulic pressure, decay would have been gone. Everybody say cleansed. The earth had been cleansed. Now watch, bear with me. But it wasn't, it wasn't just repent, get on the boat. It wasn't just the water that washed away. Is this simple enough? Are y'all caught it tonight? Let the dove out. And when Jesus come up out of the water as the firstborn of every creation, as our example, as our, Bible calls him our brother. He's our firstborn brother, scripture says. As our example, as a born again son of God or child of God. That's why he was baptized as our example, example that we would be baptized, submerged in water. And when he comes up out of the water, what descends on him? The spirit of the Lord, like as a, a man. Why? It's the sign of newness. I don't have peace in my life. Let me tell you how to get it. Get on that boat, get those sins washed away and peace on earth is coming. That's what the Holy Ghost does. It brings peace. And the dove returned and said, there's new land. There's new life. And that's why the Bible says, and they were all filled with what? The Holy Ghost. Acts 8, when they come out of the water, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts 10, Acts 19, they come out of the water. They were filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues. What is that? It's the Spirit of the Lord saying, it's a new beginning. It's all clean now. It's a brand new start. How many believe that that's what? Oh, I thought I had to sign a, sign a church line. I thought I had to shake the preacher's hand. I thought I had to be a, do a membership class. That's not salvation. Salvation is repent. Turn from your sin. I don't want to be a part. I'll walk with you. I want to walk with you. I'll live your way. I'll live according to your word. Take me to the water. Take me to the water. Because I want that stuff washed out of my life. When you come up out of the water, the dove's coming. That's a parallel, by the way, a dove. The Holy Ghost is not a dove. It's an example of what, how, the nature of his spirit. It's the breath of God. It's the peace of God. It's the life of God. Honey, I couldn't love you more. And I love living this life with you. And it's amazing how many people that I've seen come to God and when they are filled with his spirit, they said, I didn't realize how much more I could love my spouse, my family. So Colossians 2, 9 says, in him, speaking of Christ, dwelled all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Are you ready? And we are complete in him. Romans 6 says, we are buried with him in the baptism. And when I get in him, I'm actually burying my past and my shame to arise a new creature in Christ Jesus, a new person. 
D.J. Hopp would say, human in him. Aren't you glad you can have salvation? Doesn't matter how bad you've been. He makes all things new. He makes all things new. God, I've preached the word tonight. I've taught them. I just pray that your spirit would move and heal and touch and do what I can't do. In Jesus' name. This altar is open for anybody that wants to pray. If you want to be baptized, I'll baptize you. If you want to repent, we'll pray with you. You need a healing in your body. Listen, this altar is completely cleansed by his spirit. His spirit falls in this church. It's clean. Can you say amen? Everybody say the breath of God. I mean, I think all, I think every man in this room ought to start seeking God right now because of what I told y'all earlier. I'm going to talk about him in my home. I'm going to celebrate him when I'm at the house of God. I'm going to tell my kids about my experience. Come on, all over this building. You want to come and pray, you can. I realize it's 8.03. If you need to go, you can. If you want to pray and worship, you can. They're going to sing. We're going to let the Lord move among us. You want to kneel. You want to wear, whatever you feel to do tonight. I want everybody in the building, though, to respond to his word right now. Come on, everybody in the building, some way, start responding. God, I want it. I need it. I love you, Jesus. Oh, God, I thank you for your word.